Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here. I'm Jack Curry, and today I'm joined by Jack McDowell, a former Cy Young Award winner who had a very memorable 1995 season with the Yankees. And Jack, as I welcome you into our show, the first thing I'd like to ask you is, how are you and your family doing during these challenging times? Uh, we're, we're doing like the 99.9% uh, .9 of the country, hanging out, waiting for all this stuff to disappear. And that's encouraging to hear. Let's dig into some baseball since you've got the time to talk some baseball. I laughed at your text when I texted you. You said, I got nothing else to do. And that made me laugh. <laughs> your, your 12 year major league career, you had a Cy Young, which I already mentioned. You had three years where you pitched 250 plus innings. You pitched in the postseason. When you reflect on your own career, what are you most proud of? Um, I, I mean, looking back on it, probably the innings and complete games and stuff like that. Cause that's the kind of stuff that's disappeared, you know, and, and for the wrong reasons, really. Cause I think it's funny because people talk about, you know, oh, complete games, you know, the complete games that are important to your team are the ones that are, Hey, we've got a nine, nothing lead after the second inning. Guess what? Well, Penn, you can go order pizza. <laughs> Because I ain't giving up 10 runs, and I'm going to stick out here till it's done, and everyone goes gets to, to do it. And nowadays, man, you're out, in, you're out in five innings if you have a, a huge lead like that. So they, don't, they're, they're, they preserve the starters and instead of preserving the team. I'm glad you brought that up because 1991, you had 15 complete games. Since then, only one pitcher has matched that. Kurt Schilling had 15 in 1998. No one has exceeded it. Where was that mentality born from? And I, I know you pitched at a different time, but it wasn't 1970 when you were pitching. But you were a guy who your teammate said he wanted the ball for nine innings. He wanted to be out there. Yeah, you just that's what you did. You know, you were the pitcher. I always said I would be, it would be fun if baseball was, okay, you got the ball here. Other team's got one guy on the ball. Let's go. Last man standing wins. You know, it's 21 to 19. Hang with him. You got to outlast the other guy. The funny thing was, um, when Charlie Huff came over to the White Sox from the Texas Rangers, we talked a lot and we talked about, you know, how, how you can become better, how you can you know, get better. He's one of the best pitching coaches I ever had before he ever became a pitching coach. It's the stuff he said. And he said, you know what I do? My goal was I knew in Texas it was going to be 105 all summer and guys were going to get tired. And that if I outlasted them, I was going to win some games. Last man standing is going to win. And that really hit home with me. I was like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Just stay out there. You're going to get your wins, you know? These days, as you already mentioned, a pitcher approaches 100 pitches, and most of the time the bullpen is already ready to go. David Cohen, one of your former teammates and your buddies, said to me, if a guy's never thrown 115 pitches, he's never going to know what kind of pitcher he can be at 115 pitches. He might be as successful on pitch 115 as he was on pitch 75, you don't give him the chance to do it. He's never going to know. That's always been one of my theories as to why there's an increase in injuries is because no one's ever allowed to go over a certain number. Yet if they're struggling, they can still get up to that number. If you've ever pitched, you know that if you're struggling physically on the mound and you're a little bit off that day, the next day you wake up and you were so sore. You're like, oh my, something was off yesterday and everything was not working correctly. But then there's those days where everything's cruising and you're throwing like it's nothing. And the next day you can probably pitch again, you know, even though people freak out about that and not pay attention to that anymore. But because of that, you're not allowed when you're doing good to pitch up to 140 pitches to gain the strength to be able to handle that really hard 90. You know, 90 pitches that you struggle your butt off to get to. You're not built up. They never allow anyone to build up to get the strength to do that. And I believe that's one of the reasons why there's a lot more injuries. Jack, when you were traded to the Yankees, I went back and dug up some old articles and was looking. In that spring training, you said, all eyes are on us. We're the team to beat. What was the attitude of that 1995 Yankee team? Well, I mean, everybody's, yeah, this is a good group of guys that wanted to win. And, um, you know, it, it was fun, even though the trade was illegal. Trade happened. Trade happened during the lockout, and I, I ended up work all that out, right? 
Yeah. And, and, you know, it was one of those things where you think the players association is going to fight for one player when all this stuff just went down. I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't even know until it went down. I said, well, am I really going to be a Yankee? Am I going to be a White Sox and have to play seven years to become a free agent? No, I had to play seven years to become a free agent in the last year with the Yankees. And, you know, it was a really strange situation. So, you know, I had to run in there and, and get ready. But, we, you know, it was a fun team. Probably the most the, – that might have been one of my more fun years. A lot of people look back on the one gesture incident and say, oh, he hated it there. He couldn't handle it there. It was one of my funnest years I had. And it was a lot of fun playing for that group of guys and for Show Walter and you know being able to being able to take Donnie to the playoffs for the first time. You, you mentioned that incident. I, I was going to ask you three or four other questions first, but since you mentioned it, late July, you struggle in a game against the White Sox. You're getting booed as you go off the mound. You decide to raise your middle finger to the fans. But Jack, after that happened, you were nine and four with an ERA of under three. Uh, something locked in after that. What what happened in that incident, and, and how did you handle it going forward? The whole situation began because you go back and look at that at that season, and Jimmy Key was our opening day starter. I was our number two, and then after that, it was pieced together. Mm-hmm. You know, it was pieced together the rest of the year. Jimmy Key only lasted two starts, and then he was hurt. He was out for the year. Buck Walter pulled me in, and he goes, "Hey, Jack, I know that." you're an innings eater and you don't care about your stats. You care about winning games. He said, we're going to need you to just eat up innings. You know, whether you're doing good or bad, you're just going to have to stay out there. Cause you know, we got too many young guys here. They're just trying to figure it out. And we can't put it on the bullpen. You got to do what you do. And you know, I know you're a team guy and that's what you're doing. I was like, yeah, that, let's go, let's go do it. So there were a handful of starts for the Yankees where normally your starting pitcher would be the heck out of there because they're getting knocked around and they're not on top of their game. But I would stay in there for seven or eight innings regardless. And the White Sox one was about, I think it was two or three below average starts in a row where I was getting booed every time for sticking out there for seven or eight innings. And I'm like, well, are, are we not figuring this out, folks? That, you know, I'm here sucking it up for the team. And that was frustrating me. But then when it was the White Sox beating me up, the team that traded me, and I was frustrated with that, and then they're booing me again, that just, I lost it. I lost control then. So, you know, after that was just lost for a little frustration. Well, some New Yorkers w- would love that type of emotion. And I, and I think they probably did because here's a guy out here saying, hey, I'm, I'm trying my best. I have to ask you, I know the baseball project, some of those guys in that band are friends of yours. They, they did a song called Yankee Flipper. How soon after that happened were you able to kind of chuckle at that name? It was a New York Post headline. Well, it was only a couple of days to tell you the truth. I was really worried that I was going to get buried and that, you know, everyone was going to come after me. And, and believe it or not, the fans themselves kind of jumped back on my side almost a day after that. You know, as I go into the stadium, you know, when you walk into Yankee Stadium, you're walking through fans every day. And they were just like, hey, man, we love you. Come on, let's go. Keep plugging away. Keep going. They were, they were all into it. And I felt like, wow, this almost turned me into a hero for some reason. <laughs> you know? I was out there um, that day, and cool. I remember we asked you, we said, Jack, you didn't sign any autographs. And you said, I never sign autographs on my way into the ballpark. One incident isn't going to cause me to change what my approach has been all year long. So you remained firm and true to who you were. Yeah, pretty much. That's kind of the way I am. Uh, you go back to September of that year, you're dealing with a back injury. David Cohn has told me that the two of you used to almost joke some gallows humor. He was also hurting. His arm was dragging that used to say to each other, I'll give you a cortisone shot. You give me a cortisone shot. Maybe we can get through this. How, how hurting were you guys at that point? Well, Coney had your, your typical, you know, tendonitis, soreness in shoulder and just like, you know, end of the year, not going so good soreness just about every start from the time we got him, but he still dealt. If you go back and look, he did great. My problem was the last um, I the last start that I made of the regular season, the start before warming up, I felt something kind of I just felt a sharp pain in my lat muscle, like lower lat muscle in my ribs. And I was like, ah, that's weird. And I threw, you know, I think I threw like seven or eight innings. I was fine. The next game I went out there, I felt it again. And it ended up being the, 
a three nothing shutout against the Yankees, but man, it was the next start. I couldn't even move my arm and it ended up being like a golf ball size lump in on my lat muscle that my, my <laughs> the bone had to rub over it every time I cocked my arm and that was very painful. So I didn't start for the last two starts. I think two, maybe two or three, I forget what it was, three starts of September, try to get ready. You know, see, we didn't know if we were going to be in the playoffs or not, but I, you know, they didn't know how to fix me. They couldn't give me a cortisone shot because it was too close to my lungs. And so they just like hang with them and see what happens. And when the postseason came, it was the first time I picked up a ball from then. And the day before that, my first start, Buck was like, how do you feel? I'm like, ready? Let's go. Yeah. Ready to go. go. That's probably I mean, why. I mean, in this day and age, I've never even been able to smell the field. That's probably why when I asked David Cohn, and he had a long career, I said, who's some of your toughest teammates ever? And, and you were the, the first name that he mentioned. And you guys are tied together, Jack, in 1995 from that game five. And this quarantining situation that we're in, we're seeing a lot of old baseball games. I've, I've revisited it and watched game five of 1995. How prepared were you to be called out, out of the bullpen from that game? Had Showalter kind of given you a heads up that that was looming? Yeah, I mean, I think it was one of those things where, you know, we kind of both like, oh, you know, I'll be out there. I, John Wetland had had a tough time against Seattle that entire year and even in the playoffs. And so that was one of those things. Mariano Rivera, his first year, wasn't who he was. He, you know, he had stuff yet, but he wasn't established yet. And I always laugh about that because I, the, you know, when you see the, the, the little meme about Mariano that more people had stepped on the moon than he's allowed postseason runs. And I say, well, you can thank me for the two I got, you know, striking Edgar out of his runners when I first got taken in there. But no one ever knows about that because apparently I only threw one pitch in that game to Edgar. <laughs> That's the only one you ever see. That's the only one you ever see. You you described that pitch after the game as a horrible split finger. And, and you said earlier in this interview, you, you were a guy who told it like it is. After that game, Jack, you said there's really not any solace to be taken from this. There's only one team left standing, and that's all that matters. When you put the uniform on in spring training, that's what you play for. The rest is a waste. Talked to Don Manningly the other day, and he said, I was content that we got to the postseason, but there's pain that, that still exists from 1995. Do you feel the same way that even, even 25 years later, there's, a, there's regret? I, I mean, I am. I didn't have the greatest um, of postseason records at all, you know, and that was the most frustrating. I mean, I think because that was the only thing I wanted to do was win a championship. You know, everyone asked me, what's your biggest accomplishment in sports? And I said, winning the national championship in Stanford mm. because it's the only time. Winning a championship is the only thing that you can do in sports where you've accomplished everything you can accomplish. I don't care. I won the Cy Young. Super. Okay. Okay. I got an award. Oh, that's great. Guess what? Lost 10 games, you know, gave up 20 home runs. It's not, it wasn't, a, you can always do better as an individual. You can always have a better year. The first time that as a pitcher, the first hit you give up, you could have a better year. You could have thrown 35 no hitters. So mm -hmm. it makes no sense to be pushing for your yourself. The only thing that you go, wow, we've accomplished everything we could possibly accomplish is a championship. And that's kind of been my motto in coaching, too. I try to fire that down everyone's, everyone's throats. It's all about championships. It ain't about you. It's about winning as a team. Jack, they didn't offer you salary arbitration after the 95 season. You end up going to the Indians. Were you surprised that they didn't offer you salary arbitration? Well, it, it, was, it was a tough scenario because, um, well, I was free, that was free agency. So I was a free agent at that time. I was my first free agency. And there was only two offers out there. It was, it, it was me and Kevin Brown both had the same two offers, one from the Marlins and one from Cleveland. And it was like, who's going to go where? What are we, you know, what's going to happen? Who's going to take those two offers? Now, there's no collusion or anything going on, though. Just two offers, you know. And who went to the World Series two years later, those two teams? And I didn't know what to do, but I, I kind of panicked and said, I better take this while it's out there. You know, the, 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 the Yankees hadn't offered a specific offer yet. They also hadn't, didn't know who the manager was going to be. Correct. And so they had not hired the manager yet. So I was like, wow, if they hired the wrong guy in this scenario, this is going to be crazy. And so I, I bailed before all that happened. 
You go to the Indians, they win 99 games, but you just mentioned how the Yankees went to the World Series, end up winning it. Do you ever replay that in your head, that if, if you had stayed in New York and they went on this little dynastic run after that? Oh, absolutely. All the time. All the time. And, you know, it was just one of those things. I had to make a decision. And with only two offers out there and, you know, being the top two free agents of that class, I knew, hey, you know what? It's going to be one or, one or the other. And if I wait, someone else is going to get something. And I'm going to be sitting here going, okay, who wants me? You know, and it, after watching what happened the year before with all those guys, I'm going to go down to Florida to train because there were no offers. Um, I, I just I jumped on a solid offer at the time and took it. Jack, you were listed as 6'5", 180, and you pitched during the steroid era. When you reflect on those seasons, do you ever – have any irritation that the playing field wasn't even? Um, we I kind of all knew it was going on. And I tell people this all the time. You know, I'm, I'm pretty truthful about the whole thing. Had it been put in my face, had someone said, hey, this is going to make you recover so much quicker. And this is going to make you, I may not make your stuff better, but you're going to be able to work harder. You're going to be able to do this. And you'll recover quicker. I would have been like, okay, great. Let's go. I wouldn't even have thought twice about it. You know, there wasn't any thinking about it. It wasn't like you were, it didn't feel like you were cheating back then. It was just, it was stuff guys were doing. So Jack, I have to tell you that in preparation for this interview, I was listening to Ape and the King from uh, Stick Figure. That was your second band. View was your first band. How much of a role did music play in your life then? And does it still play in your life? Oh, I mean, I, I love music at the time I was a kid. I would sit there. And I was a lyric guy. I like to sit there, listen to records, and write down the lyrics, and you know, put it back a little bit. Write down the lyrics so I'd get them all right. And you know, because you didn't have you didn't have your lyric sheets there. Nowadays, you can Google it all and find them. But back then, you had to listen. You had to listen to it and kind of decipher what the words were. And I liked cool songs, songs that were written about guys' real lives and things like that. That's what I really loved about it, and became a huge music fan. Took guitar lessons when I was 11 and 12 and didn't do much with it until college. And I started again. I started up, basically I started up when the year that I signed, I signed in 1987 after my junior year and then went back to Stanford that fall to finish up. I had two years to go and I got back there and I'm like, okay, I'm done with my classes. What am I doing the rest of the day? There's no practice. There's no lifting. There's no... I'm like, I'll oh, bring my guitar up here and we start messing around writing songs. And that's what I did. I saw you perform in Milwaukee once. I think it was attached to an all-star game. I think that's why you were there. with. Stick. Yeah, it was. It was the, the, the old the all-star game where it was the tie, right? Yes. And, and I, I came away from that. R.E.M. That, that's, that's, who you, that's who you sounded to me like at that point. I felt like you were a big R.E.M. fan. And, and that's what the music and the lyrics reminded me of. Yeah, definitely was a big fan of theirs, and most people know that. The Yeah, and my, my guitar playing development over that time was a lot with the Peter Buck's guitar playing style, which is the arpeggio picking, and that's what I learned a lot, and that's what I kind of put a lot uh, into the guitar playing I did on my records. So, so last question. I'm, I'm a huge Clash fan. When I was talking to David Cohn about you, he recollected that you and he went to a concert once and he was describing it for me. And I said, wait a second, did you guys go see Big Audio Dynamite? Which of course, yes. makes sense in the class form Big Audio Dynamite. And Coney was saying, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm like, Coney, this is big info. So did you guys go see Big Audio Dynamite together? Yeah, we went there. We went there early, um, right around, right around soundcheck to go meet him. And then we knew, we knew, hey, we're in New York. And we're kind of New York you know, stars because we're baseball players. We'll be able to get in there and meet those dudes. Let's go. And they let us in there to go uh, to go meet them and talk to them and all. That was a lot of fun. That's fantastic. Go. They probably don't remember that, but we sure do. <laughs> I would remember that. Uh, Jack, it's been a real pleasure to uh, reconnect with you and take this trip down memory lane. I, I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate you giving some time. And uh, best of luck to you and your family as we work our way through everything. All right, back at you, man. And then uh, tell Coney I said, hey.